webinar. This presentation is part of a series of risk management web conferences brought to you by Crane and Rating Hotline and Houston International Insurance Group. My name is Katie Parrish, Editorial Director of Maximum Capacity Media and your host for today's conference. Risk management affects all areas of your business and requires planning ahead to ensure your business is covered from every angle. With this series, topics have been selected to help you prepare for foreseen risks, estimate their impact, and define responses to these issues. Additionally, this webinar series will help you establish a plan and risk strategies that includes avoiding, controlling and mitigating, accepting, and transferring risk. This series will look at four themes. The first webinar, which was held a few months ago in August, focused on minimizing litigation after a crane accident. The second is post-accident litigation containment. The third in January will be on quality control elements. And the fourth, which will be in the spring, is on dynamic changes general contractors related to additional insured responsibilities. Each of these webinars will be available to be viewed again online on our YouTube channel or on the website. And a complimentary article in Crane and Rigging Hotline is available for each article or for each webinar. Uh, and they are downloadable from the magazine's website. Today's topic will look at post-accident litigation containment for your company. This webinar is presented by Kevin Cunningham, president of Hig Construction. Kevin has 30 years of experience in heavy industrial insurance and risk management. He formerly worked as a Lloyds of London's cover holder, underwriter, and crane insurance program manager on behalf of Lexington Insurance Company, Travelers Insurance Company, and National Interstate Insurance Company. Today he is president of Hig Construction, a division of Houston International Insurance Group, where he is responsible for all business development and overall risk management services for crane, pile driving, foundation, and related heavy civil construction segments. Our sponsor, Hig International Insurance Group, or Hig is an international insurance carrier that operates four wholly owned major insurance companies underwriting in more than 30 countries worldwide. Earlier this year, HIG reorganized its domestic underwriting operations to better serve the industry's needs. If you have questions about the presentation or specific questions about HIG industrial insurance and risk management, Kevin's contact information has been included oops, let's see, on the stage, and it will be available again at the end of this presentation. Before we start this presentation, I want to thank you again for attending. If you have questions during the presentation, please type them into the chat box on your screen, and we'll do a Q&A at the end of the presentation. Kevin's slides will also be available after the presentation, and follow-up information will be sent to you later this week or early next week on specifics of this topic. Additionally, this presentation is being recorded and can be accessed on the Maximum Capacity U Media YouTube channel at youtube.com slash maxcapmedia.com or Crane and Rigging Hotline's website, cranehotline.com. Now I'd like to pass the controls over to Kevin, and Kevin can uh, begin whenever he's ready. Thanks, Katie. Okay, make sure they can see what. All right, we're trying to get my computer up. Sorry about that. All right, let's uh, let's jump into this. Appreciate the opportunity to talk with you all today, and uh, let's just review this slightly. Um, as you can see, we have uh, nine separate sections of material to cover today, and we'll do our best to stay on point for a uh, meaningful education session with you. We will start with an overview of today's session and, and touch on future webinars in this continuing series. As Katie had mentioned, we'll get into a little bit of specifics there so you can see the sequential order and try to tie them all together. We all have the same outcome objective of containing litigation for a crane owner and its company. Um, then we'll look at the impact of indemnification. And indemnification requirements will really be uh, the main theme of what we're going to talk about today. It is an ever-evolving, ever-changing dynamic. And uh, so the bulk of today's discussion will be uh, indemnification requirements and how it impacts you when crane accidents occur. Then we'll touch on the history and public policy behind the recent anti-indemnity movement, which is spreading across the U.S. Uh, next, we'll cover the two types of extent of fault within the anti-indemnity movement. And then we'll share 
a 50 state illustration of individual state positions on anti-indemnity and it has reference to the applicable civil codes and case law um, for those operating in different venues across the country. Uh, next, we'll discuss the worst and best jurisdictions according to a recent study completed by the U.S. Chamber of Commerce Institute for Legal Reform. And then we will get into the two types of anti-indemnity, starting with sole negligence and then some reference to the any negligence statutes. And lastly, we'll discuss some recent case law trends and we'll identify two prime case examples showing the power of the anti-indemnity legislation and how it can work for you to protect your interests and to help you contain litigation in your business. So let's get going. We'll uh, jump into the overview section. All right. As an overview of litigation containment from an overall perspective, we, need, we think it's important that we all recognize that there are four key elements in any major crane accident that will connect directly to your ability to contain litigation. First, we should identify the recent changes in OSHA and B30 crane operational responsibilities. Some of these were discussed in the last uh, maximum capacity media risk management webinar that Katie referred to. Two, we need to realize that there have been significant modifications in various state laws relating to indemnification responsibilities. And as mentioned in the opening, this session will focus primarily on indemnity changes, similar to the last webinar that focused primarily on key OSHA changes that can impact litigation containment. Number three, when we Acknowledge the fact that crane operations are much more complex than other facets of heavy construction. And we establish innovative methods for crane accident management specific to crane industry operational responsibilities. We can protect crane owner interests and contain litigation accordingly. That will be the gist of the, the next workshop. Um, that workshop will be entitled Quality Control Elements for Effective Crane Accident Management. And this, session, this next session will include some participation from some key engineers and legal representatives to support this theme. Um, the point of reference in, on the previous webinar and the next webinars after this are, again, the four elements connect um, in the theme of containing litigation. And lastly, the, the risk management series uh, will cover the evolving additional insurance tactics by the general contractors to contain litigation. And uh, that will be sometime in the spring, as Katie mentioned. So let's we'll move on. All right, impact of indemnification. As the article noted, today's market continues to evolve as it relates to general contractor and prime contractor's ability, or as importantly, maybe more importantly, lack of ability to force unwarranted indemnification terms on subcontractors and crane companies. These contractual risk transfer elements have previously had very significant negative impact on the crane industry's capability to even attempt to contain litigation. And even though project owners and, and general contractors are continuously trying to find loopholes to insulate themselves from any job site accident responsibilities, most state legislators have been aggressively amending their respective state rules of law to establish an increased fairness as it relates to which parties on a construction site can be held responsible for accidents. Two very notable success stories as it relates to anti-indemnity are the state of Texas and the state of Florida. And the crane industry was a driving factor in both of these winning initiatives. The Texas Crane Owners Association 
and the Florida Crane Owners Council both sponsored, developed, brought in lobbyists, fought the battle, raised money, and effectively changed state law as it relates to upper tier contractors forcing unwarranted indemnification onto lower tier contractors, which opens the opportunity for any crane owner to contain litigation when an accident occurs. Now let's discuss how these anti-indemnity laws came about in the first place. Just after the, as the article noted, just after the intense insurance crisis in the mid-1980s, subcontractors had a difficult time even getting insurance. So the onus fell on the GC and project owners. The original intent of indemnification from their perspective was to shift the party from, shift the risk, excuse me, from one party's negligence to another since they were forced to, to take large self-insured retention. So it became um, a big guy on the block versus little guy on the block kind of uh, bullying effort. Once the insurance market settled down and the general contractor's market's intent was obvious that to shift risk of any negligence through newly developed construction subcontract agreements, basically the general contractors had successfully uh, positioned themselves with superior bargaining power and ultimately dominated the lower tier subcontract. The, the public outcry and the American Subcontractors Association as a national group, in addition to, to other groups like Texas and Florida Crane Association, urged the courts to create a more fair business environment. And the positive outcome of this effort um, and the likes of the American Subcontractors Association, Florida Crane Owners, Texas Crane Owners, has led many courts and state legislatures legislatures to reject, modify, or, or even completely invalidate such risk shifting. So now the majority of states have enacted at least some version of anti-indemnity. And while it is still isn't a perfect environment, these changes actually level the playing field for subcontractors to be in a position to contain litigation when an accident occurs where before they had no chance whatsoever. There are two basic types of anti-indemnity we need to discuss, and it goes to degree of fault. A, for sole negligence. B, for any negligence. Now, let's check out, we're going to come back to the sole and, and uh, any negligence, but I want to show you a 50-state slide and, and talk about just a couple of these items. Um, you'll note the delineation for barring indemnity for sole negligence in the left-hand column and related in, in the middle column, the any negligence and the related civil codes that apply to each respective state on the far right side. Let's go through and identify a few peculiar states' treatment of anti-indemnification before we move on to the next slide. If you take a look at right out of the gates, Arizona and California, they're completely opposite of each other. One bars negligence, bars indemnity for sole negligence in private work, the other in public. Uh, California only bars any negligence in residential construction defect only, but does allow for sole negligence in, California, um, in um, public works, public and commercial are, are interchangeable. Um, two very close states geographically, yet, yet almost completely opposite in how their treatment. We go down the, down the list, switch over to the other list. Um, Florida, which has great commercial and public construction rules of law as it relates to anti-indemnity, um, has no applicability in residential construction. Louisiana has no residential um, and only allows for prime contracts on public projects to have any barring of, of indemnification. Look at North Dakota 
sorry, North Dakota and Pennsylvania. They, they're silent. There's no statutes at all. Texas, public projects only, no residential. Vermont and Wyoming, they're silent. So as you can see, um, each state has some varying degree of anti-indemnity, yet there isn't a whole lot of consistency across the states, and it is continually evolving and changing in fairly regularly in forthcoming legislative sessions. All right, now let's check out some of the worst and best jurisdictions. The U.S. Chamber did this study of, 50, of all 50 states, and they interviewed over 1,100 attorneys on several legal facets in their respective state courts over a 10-year period. The study is available. It will be attached uh, with some information going back to maximum capacity after this webinar. You can all have access to it. And overall, according to the study, and when we take a look at all the anti-indemnity that's going on, the current direction is bearing very well for crane companies and subcontractors to be in a position to, to contain litigation. Um, only 33%, it seems like a lot, uh, attributed you know, straightforward bias by judges and juries in the unfair jurisdictions, and you'll see those down below, or right underneath there as the worst jurisdiction. Um, they are the usual suspects, Illinois, Los Angeles, San Francisco, Philadelphia, and oddly enough, Texas as a state is a, is a good state as it relates to anti-indemnification or an unfairness, with the exception of one county called Jefferson County. And the best jurisdictions uh, were somewhat predictable as well, although I was a little surprised that there's no reference to New York in, in either case, good or bad, as they were in the middle of the pack. That, and you can see if you would like a copy of the report. So based on the overall state liability ranking scores, there has been a double-digit improvement over the past 10 years. Um, and the average grades by attorneys, they literally graded them A through F by state, considering all elements across all 50 states, 49% of the states graded in the A or B category and only 16% of the states were graded in the B and F category as it relates to um, bias in poor jurisdictions for fair outcomes in, in trial court settings. All right, let's discuss sole negligence statutes. Pretty basic stuff. Um, only banning sole negligence still allows for risk shifting. Now clearly if a general contractor or a prime contractor or another contracted party at a site was clearly the solely responsible party, um, the anti-indemnification can protect you. However, uh, it's a, sometimes a tough road to hoe uh, and it involves um, concept of, of having experts at your disposal immediately to uh, prove uh, negligence on other parties and that there was no contributing negligence on your part, um, but it's a start. So, so banning sole negligence does still allow for some element of risk shifting. Um, about half of all anti-indemnity states are for sole negligence only, and the potential fault determination can eliminate the, the anti-indemnity provision, but if we can keep in mind that a prompt or immediate rapid response investigation um, can help prove that you are not, that you had no responsibility, um, or certainly that others could be the sole responsible parties, um, then that state statute can protect your interest and help you contain litigation. As discussed previously, the boots on the ground 
crane accident management techniques will be discussed in the, in the next webinar. So prohibiting sole negligence indemnity still also does not affect insurance requirements. That too will be discussed in a future webinar. So we don't want to get the, the two mixed up. Um, and there are tactics going on currently as recent as last week out of the International Risk Management Institute that is primarily um, attended to by the prime and general contractors. And the theme there was to find ways to get around anti-indemnity statutes. And part of it is having separate and distinct insurance responsibilities in a subcontract agreement that really that basically negates part of the anti-identification capabilities. Again, those will be discussed um, in a future workshop. Any negligence is the opposite of sole negligence, and it really applies to just two parts, um, sole or partial. All it's doing is adding the partial to the sole, and uh, the key element here is determination of, by fact, of any other party's responsibility. If you recall, as shown in the state graph, some states apply. Some states um, do bar indemnification in prime contracts only, and some bar it in subcontracts, and some in residential, and some in public. So um, each state has different rules of law. Pretty basic consideration that, that if you are traveling over state boundaries, you should be using different contracts. Um, you should be aware of the contracts that the, the local con general contractors are, are going to uh, request of you. And uh, it's been our experience that having that most general contractors have some latitude as it relates to crane rental agreements or crane subcontract agreements, um, where we can you can lessen some of the burden. So the concept here is that if you don't try, you can never prevail. And if you just accept what is put in front of you, you will have no ability to contain litigation against your company. All right, now let's talk about some recent case law. There's actually some trends in favor of the indemnity provisions. Um, and as mentioned previously, the general contractor, prime contractors, are continually attempting to insulate themselves um, from these new state requirements that were enacted to, to balance the scales of justice or to create a more fair trading environment. Some are even going as far as to litigate certain project agreements to try to categorize them as not being construction agreements to attempt to avoid the anti-indemnity provision. Um, that's a stretch. Uh, Couple have, a couple of these cases happened in New Mexico. They are referenced on your screen. Um, just as a side note, the, both of these cases will be, uh, the detail behind it will be sent to Maximum Capacity Media, who can forward those um, full case studies to anybody that's looking for them. Um, but let's take a look at the two. In the Hoquin versus Foucault, oil services, the New Mexico Court of Appeals examined their local NMSA code sections, 56-71, which is the construction anti-indemnity statute. And there's a little complications because two different um, codes applied because this was also an oil field project. So the oil field anti-indemnity indemnity statute applied as well, and that is 56-7-2. Um, in this case, Southern Union, the prime, hired three contractors to work at a Southern Union oil field in New Mexico. Hoquin, an employee of one of the contractors, was injured at the site and sued Southern Union and two other contractors. Southern Union sought indemnity against the contractors based on its contracts with these subcontractors. Um, and the Court of Appeals actually reversed the original trial court position um, as to the 
oil field anti-indemnity statute because the work did not pertain to an oil and gas well. However, the appellate court affirmed the trial court ruling um, as to the construction anti-indemnity statute. So the full effect, however, looking at it, um, was to send the case back to the trial court where the apportionment of liability could be addressed against each party based on each party's own negligence. The effective outcome was the court's ruling supports the general legal concept that a party cannot contract away its own negligence. So the subcontractor prevailed. In the other case, United Rentals, Northwest versus Year Out Mechanical, Year Out prevailed in both district court and in the Court of Appeals. The courts ruled that the identification language in United Rentals contract was unenforceable under New, New Mexico law. United Rentals argued that the equipment rental agreement uh, was not in fact a construction contract. As such, United Rental argued that New Mexico Statute 56-7-1 did not apply with regard to the indemnification provision in the contract with, with year out. However, the New Mexico Supreme Court disagreed, determining that a rental agreement for construction equipment does in fact fall within the parameters of a construction agreement. So, any moving parts? Um, I'm going to wrap this up a little bit earlier. Last workshop we had ran long because we had so many questions. Um, so we really want to talk about in, in the conclusionary statement that we all recognize how dynamic the crane industry is uh, with many different trades involved, leasing, renting, using the equipment many different state rules and regulations, many different authorities, federal OSHA, state OSHA, B30 standards, ANSI standards, et cetera, et cetera. And it's been our experience, all of these things have a direct impact on, on a crane owner's ability to contain litigation when, it's, when an accident occurs. So recognizing these very many complex variables in the continually evolving scope of opportunity um, with changing state laws on indemnification and trying to create, a, or most states trying to create a, an environment of fairness. Um, concept being recognizing that there is an opportunity uh, to protect your interests would be the first step in positioning your company to contain litigation. Um, lastly, surrounding your company with crane industry experts in safety, legal, insurance, crane operations that understand and care enough to fight through the continual changing risk management maze will position your company um, in, its, in its best way possible to contain litigation when crane accidents occur. Um, that concludes today's uh, brief workshop. I realize we're, we're a little bit short and um, wanted to open it up for questions and answers and uh, see how we can from here. Great. Okay. Um, we do have a couple of questions for you, Kevin. And I do think that um, if you hadn't, if you missed my comment below, uh, please type in your email address in the question box if you would like to receive the presentation and or the case studies or you need anything else from me after the event, I'm happy to send that to you today. Also, the webinar has, is being recorded and um, I will have the recording up on our YouTube channel by the end of the day today as well and on Crane Hotline's website. So if you missed those um, or if you want to get more information, just let me know if you missed the last one. It's up on our YouTube channel as well. And um, like Kevin mentioned, like we mentioned before, we have two more webinars uh, planned for this series. So make sure you're keeping an eye out for those too. Uh, let me get back to my notes and I'll put Kevin's uh, contact information up here on the screen. And we'll work on some of these questions here. 
Moving on. All right. Um, does ASME B30.5 responsibilities have a big impact on contracts? Um, absolutely. Uh, well, it, it, it's a relevant uh, situation. The B30 is uh, uh, clearly a driver of responsibility. Um, B30, if we look at the um, just some of the side dynamics that, that, that exist in, in that uh, set of rules, um, the largest uh, purchaser of the B30 standards book, booklet, um, is annually is the plaintiff's bar. So I, I think it, um, the, to answer the question is there, there is a, um, an indirect connection to contain litigation because plaintiff's bar uses the B30 standards to attempt to determine fault and responsibility against crane owners uh, because you may not have um, operated exactly in accordance with with any respective B30 standards. So it's kind of an indirect yes. Um, Defense counsel does use it when we, when from an insurance claims and litigation standpoint, when we investigate a serious accident and can prove uh, with fact that we, in, in fact, uh, that the crane owner operated completely within the B30 standards and corresponding OSHA rules. We, we then use it, but it is more often used by the plaintiff bar against us. You may have gone over this before, but I'm going to go ahead and ask it again. How about proportional indemnity? Can you explain that again? Good, good question. Um, basically, there's there's two parts. Uh, the the silent states ones on that list that have no no bearing whatsoever. They're, they're going to allow. Um, for indemnification if it is determined to be fair because they, they're silent. They take no position. Those states that bar sole negligence, that's pretty pretty clear cut, but it has to be proven. The partial responsibility side is, is really where it gets complicated. Um, so all that it means uh, from, from my perspective on behalf of a crane owner is um, other parties that are proven to have a re responsibility of fault that created damages um, within the accident site or scene um, will, will fall under the uh, under the statute. The, the, uh, the concept being that that um, it can't be contracted away when it can be determined that that a, a party is is partially contributing. So you can't they can't um, have a contract downstream to a crane owner that, and then be proven that they were partially responsible. The the indemnification for responsibility um, is negated. So that partial is is very very important because typically general contractors prime contractors um, will be present in part of the crane project site um, and would therefore logically have some re area of responsibility so they can't just contract that responsibility away and say they have no, no resulting liability. So the partial is huge. I think what most states are trying to do, most, most state legislatures are trying the ones that were successful in getting sole negligence are now trying to get the sole and partial negligence because it's just a, a broader um, step to achieving increased fairness. And the desired outcome is if, if my company is responsible for the accident, then it should be uh, financially responsible with insurance and lawsuits. And if it isn't, it shouldn't as opposed to that contract dictating who is the responsible party. So the partial allows for that to even get to to a court 
and try to make some determination of fault. Did that answer the question? Good. Okay, great. A um, couple more here. If ground conditions are the responsibility of the controlling entity, uh, I'm sorry, are, are ground conditions the responsibility of the controlling entity? Great. Yeah, that's, um, yes. As I understand it, now here's one that connects, um, E30 would have some impact, but but the new federal OSHA rules, and my understanding is that uh, my understanding is the state rules track with it, is um, the controlling entity is the responsible party, and the caveat is unless the crane owner affected the ground, uh, made some changes to the ground. Um, made some changes to the design for outriggers or placement of outriggers, um, then, then the crane owner would have some um, equal or shared responsibility for ground condition. But for the most part, the crane owner doesn't have the capability to determine um, if, they're, if the crane, not only the weight of the crane, but the weight of the load in addition to the weight of the crane um, is sufficient to handle. So so the new rule and the, the new ability to contain litigation in this regard is that um, the controlling entity would be that responsible party. Okay, great. Right. Bob, did that answer your question? I think, it, I think it's two parts, and I think I left off the last part. So he was asking what the crane rental companies respond, where they start if ground conditions are the responsibility of the controlling entity, and I think that did answer his question. If not, let us know. Okay, great, it did. Um, let's see, I just have one more, so if uh, you have any additional questions, please make sure you type them in now. Um, working definition of sole and any negligence, did we already go over that? We did, we can get, we can forward that to you, but I'm not sure if I understand the question. Um, I think he's asking, what is the working definition of sole and any negligence? Um, the any negligence is um, is really not the technical term. It is uh, it is really just a, a description um, because there's two parts. The 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 anti indemnity, the the purpose of the of the original state ruling against it was saying that. Um, no contractor, no upper or or any contractor on a site can contract away its responsibility and liability for its own sole negligence. So there, therein lies what what that really means. Um, now, very different on partial, which just says the the same principle applies. It just cannot, um, if a general contractor or prime contractor is proven to be partially responsible for the uh, event, for the accident, yet they have a contract in place that says um, they, are, they will have full indemnification and will be held harmless, that's where the, the partial negligence comes into play where the contract itself um, is negated. That contract provision is negated. But it has to be proven that that upper tier contractor that holds that bargaining power um, was in fact partially, partially responsible. So we're talking about some pretty heavy duty lifting in the, in the local courts. As you can see with those New Mexico cases, one said yes, one said no. One added complications to the oil field indemnification versus the general construction. Um, so any crane operator working in a state that has sole or and or partial, or in our terms, any, um, is in a much better fighting position um, to contain litigation than if they were just in a sole negligent state. That uh, hopefully that answers it. The, um, uh, did that answer? <laughs> Here I can give you another, at least out of one of the um, 
As you'll see in the bibliography, there was so much legalese uh, on this topic. We tried to keep it as straightforward, common language, but a loss, here's our description a, uh, or a definition. A loss is said to arise from the quote-unquote sole negligence of a party if no other party's negligence contributed to the damage. So the partial, you would just add partial responsibility. Okay. Can that affect proportional responsibility? Absolutely. Um, but not, not well, if, if the question is, in a sole negligence state, does, does proportional responsibility uh, matter? My understanding is it doesn't. Um, so if your state only negates the indemnification for sole, and there is um, partial, then, then it's negated. There, it can only be for sole. But a partial contribution to a to a causation factor um, it is the actual intent of both of the sole negligence to say if somebody else contributed, then therefore the anti indemnity does not apply. And um, in the any negligence states where where another party can be. Um, determined to have some contribution, partial responsibility, then um, that pure indemnification cannot apply either. Okay. The math law, this is one of the questions we have, and it's just asking about interpretation. Uh, the math law says that any construction contract that attempts to require a sub to indemnify anyone for an injury or damage that is not caused by the sub uh, is void and unenforceable. Can you uh, determine if that is cor a correct interpretation? I believe so. The, um, um, the oddly enough, yeah. We, are you going back to that? The, um, I was going to go back to it. Yeah, <laughs> if it was on here. Yeah, you should. You'll see the uh, Massachusetts is the one that sticks out. It's kind of a strange, a strange provision that Massachusetts allows. Um, will ban certain indemnification in subcontracts, um, but will not ban indemnification in prime contracts, which is somewhat confusing because a prime contract, I guess, would go between a general contractor and an owner. So there's, there's no allowance for anti-indemnity. Um, but it does ban certain indemnification clauses within the subcontracts that most crane owners would, would be responsible for. We can dig into that for the um, participant and uh, actually send part of the report that we used um, if, if that could help. Sure. Scott, if that's something that you're interested in, just um, holler and let me know if that, if that is. Okay. I think that we have answered everyone's questions. If there are no further questions, um, you know, we really appreciate you all spending your week, your holiday week with us. And if you have uh, something come up in the future, I put my contact information up on the screen as well as Kevin's. And um, feel free to ask us anything that you need. The presentation recording should be up on our YouTube channel uh, by the end of the day today. Anyone who's asked for materials, I'm happy to send those out today as well. And um, if there are no further questions, thank you all for being here. Happy Thanksgiving. And we look forward to seeing you all in January for, our, for the third section of the risk management <laughs> webinar series. And we'll be sending out invites shortly for those. You all take care. Thank you very much. And thank you, Kevin. Thank you.